So there's this section of land that I go to on a regular basis. And they have this history, historical marker on the main road. And I can't remember what it says, but it says something about King Philip. Not King Philip of England, but met a comet who was labeled or carried himself about as King Philip. So it wasn't his real name. But they were the Along Quinn. Along Quinn people. They had a long history of raising up questions. And they would carry those questions, the ones that they couldn't answer all on their own. Or if they needed to expand knowledge on something, they would bring the questions to the Iroquois. And so their frequent... Uh, visits to the Iroquois gave them, the Iroquois gave them a section of land, almost like a second home. So when they came through, they would first go to the section of land and they would make themselves comfortable and at home and get the needed rest from their travels, and then they would send word to the Iroquois that they wanted to, uh, you know, have conversations with them. So King Philip, as he is known throughout history, he is almost... You know, every time I see, like, a heart, you know, he was, like, he was brought into the heart of the Iroquois. And his, his men, the men that accompanied him of great strength and stature, they were, like, really, like, incredible people, but they... They came from up north, up where the Passamaquoddy and the Penobscot are. That's, that's King Philip's home up there. So, anyways, I go to this one place, and I always fall asleep there. You know, I'll pull in to eat lunch or something, but it's like only a matter of maybe five or ten minutes, and I always fall asleep there. And when I fall asleep, I always, it's almost like I travel all, all the way to the Huron. And, they, and it's like when I start to wake up, it's almost like I get... You know, like a clearer and clearer vision of them. And so it happened again today on Father's Day. And the Huron were closely linked to these black wolves. And they weren't, uh, it's almost like they were blood tied together with these black wolves. And so they would often, it's almost like the best way to, I don't even know how to explain this, but when I woke up from my nap, 
it's like I automatically went to, you know, I went through this whole stream of searching for the right word to describe it. And I already posted it on my Facebook, but Anglo, Anglo. And so <clears throat> it's the angle in which they took because they had to, they had to taper down on their anger because anger rises the level for the, not the want, because the average person doesn't want to, but there's this need to kill. And so they had to taper their anger before it ever rose to the occasion of the need to kill. And so <clears throat> they carry themselves by foot, mostly by foot. And they were first introduced to the method of travel on horseback by the Sioux. And so that tapering, you know, the need to kill was not tapered down. And so it was at an all time high with the Huron. And so they came like this close to leveling the Sioux. And as soon as they got close to their eyes, they stopped. And the reason why they stopped is because the Huron could see quite a distance, not just in the future, but behind them as well. And they could see that the Sioux were there to protect them. And they, were they would come a day that the movement that the Sioux made on behalf of the Huron would need, need some additional knowledge, let's say. And so the tapering, looking at their eyes, they tapered down on the need to kill. It's like, an, it's like a natural instinct that occurs with all things, there's this need to kill. And so they worked closely with the Sioux and the Sioux wanted to know what caused them to get to the, like the boiling point, the boiling point of anger that rises the temperature to the onset of the need to kill. And so in their conversations, they first started out saying that they spent too much time in the company of wolves. And so, you know, the Huron didn't go anywhere without wolves. They slept with wolves. They traveled with wolves like they were one, okay? <clears throat> and so at first view of the situation, because the Sioux wanted to have the relationship with the Huron <clears throat> for many reasons, you know, besides just sharing knowledge. But they didn't want to risk having their women and their children around the Huron because the Huron men never ro rose 
their anger never rose to any boiling points around their women and children, but the, around other men, it did. And so to bring the women and children together on both sides, the Sioux's biggest concern was the tapering down of the boiling point because they didn't want their women and children to see if that boiling point point ever got matched in some way and then you know they'd lay each other down and so the Sioux <laughs> the Sioux separate they they basically took one Huron who was traveling by himself with his wolf and they came up fast behind him and they were able to capture the wolf in this net and they separated the two to test it out and they carried the wolf quite a distance away from the man to see how the man would act and respond and how the wolf would act and respond. And they both walked around like they were lost, like they were like they were so disconnected. And then when they brought them back together, it's almost like they became one again. And so that was their first learning of the Huron. It's pretty interesting. Pretty interesting to think about it. The nesting with the wolves. The long hibernation periods with wolves. And how they were like the, the same. And how the Huron and the Sioux became almost like the Huron man and the wolf. The Huron and the Sioux became one over time. <sighs> There's more to this, but I'm tired.